Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. René Magnan. She is Associate Professor and Director of Experimental Training in the Department of Psychology at Washington State University. She applies social psychological theory to address issues in preventive health behaviors and health behavior promotion. Specifically, much of her research in her lab focuses on understanding the role that the fact plays on health decisions and behavior. She is interested in both how one's feelings about health behaviors may influence their decisions to engage in health behavior, and also how health behaviors may influence one's feelings. So, Dr. Magnan, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It's a real pleasure to have you on. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Okay, great. So, I mean, I don't think that I ever had an interview on elf psychology on my show, even even though I've already done more than 300 interviews. So, anyway, I guess that the first question I would like to ask you is, uh, what are the kinds of questions, behaviors that elf psychology is interested in studying? Uh, yeah, health psychology is um, focused on any behavior that influences health. Um, so we often think of big ones like physical activity, um, diet, sleep, but it can also be things like flossing or uh, adherence to medication, um, uh, coping techniques for uh, reducing stress, um, vaccination. So it's it's um, a really wide um, berth of types of behaviors. Um, in terms of questions, um, health psychologists use we call it a biopsychosocial perspective, and that just means that we look at health as um, integrating biological, social, and psychological factors. So um, kind of historically in medicine, um, it's been thought that the mind and the body are separate, and health psychologists think that they are, in, you know, they in, they're interactive, they work together, what affects the body is going to in, uh, affect the mind and vice versa. Um, so health psychologists are interested in promoting health and wellness. Um, they're interested in preventing uh, health problems and disorders along the line and um, down the line. They're also interested in healthcare and how to make healthcare work better, policies, that kind of thing. So there's quite a, a variety of different questions that health psychologists um, try to address. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, so in terms of the so-called nature-nurture debate, I mean, I guess that you probably are an, an interactionist. You take into account individual factors like ge genetics and the kinds of environments people are exposed to, uh, but also, uh, I mean, <laughs> those environmental factors and others and probably also social ones and the ways people interact with one another and how they are are influenced by their social milieu or something like that. Exactly. So, you know, there's certainly, you know, we're born uh, with the, the genetics that we have and the body that we have. Um, and it, it's interesting that you, our social environments, um, the environments that we uh, are in can actually, um, for lack of a better term, activate certain genetic factors um, that can, you know, make certain genes um, uh, activate that might say reduce chances of developing cancer or for some people who live in stressful environments that actually might um, change certain the, the genetic makeup a little bit so that you're more prone to other types of problems. Um, so all of these things interact um, but in terms of um, a lot of at least what I do um, we focus on behavior a lot because behavior is something that is modifiable. So. Um, it's really difficult, you know, you, you can't really change genetics, right? You know, right. It, that's, that's a difficult thing to do. Um, but you can change lifestyle. And we do know that certain lifestyle factors are associated with both health, um, you know, uh, disorders down the line as well as um, better quality of life and well-being down the line. So what we're trying to do is get people to um, 
do things long term that are good for them, that are going to promote health uh, and wellness, and um, stop doing things that aren't so good for them. So smoking, for example, is a great example of a, a lifestyle factor that is has strong associations with a lot of problems, um, and that is a totally modifiable thing. You know, something. So that's something that we can target with people to try to um, improve their health overall. Yeah. Well, as hopefully somewhere in the future with genetic engineering, people will be able to eat 500 Big Macs without, <laughs> <laughs> without becoming <laughs> obese or something like that. Right. And they sure. won't have to change their habits. But as it is right now, it's better for us to tackle things this way, I guess. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I mean, I've already mentioned the word in the introduction to the interview, but what is effect? Uh, so the very straightforward, uncomplicated answer is affect is a feeling of pleasure and displeasure. So basically feeling good or feeling bad. Um, and uh, But really affect is kind of an umbrella term that subsumes all kinds of different things um, like different discrete emotional experiences or moods um, and, and even stress. So it's kind of anything related to feelings is, is affect. Yeah. Okay, so and this is important here because affect uh, has a relationship with decision making processes, right? And decision making is uh, behind the kinds of decisions we make in terms of our health behaviors and habits and so on, right? So there's a relationship between uh, emotional affective aspects of our psychology and our decision making, correct? Yeah, and uh, our emotions or our feelings, those are important for any decisions that we make, frankly. Um, but with health it's kind of interesting obviously i think so um so one way to think about it is um some some popular ways of thinking about how we make decisions is that we've got sort of two different modes one is this sort of um reflective purposeful intentional pathway there's a lot of different uh words that are used to describe it but it's all basically the same and this is kind of um, this is how we like to think about our decision making, that, you know, we gather information, we're being logical and rational in our choices, we're thinking um, very diligently, and then we make an informed choice. Um, and we do that to some extent, but we're also influenced by um, sort of more reflexive processes. So these are things, that, um, this is where kind of emotions and affect come in. Um, so, you know, we're probably the vast majority of uh, decisions we make in any given day are actually influenced by this other mode, this other process. So, you know, if we're deciding what to wear to work, we're not really going through this huge deliberative process. At least most people, I think, probably aren't. Um, when you're deciding what to eat, maybe, you're, you know, in that moment, you're persuaded by how you feel. And it, you're not really, a lot of people, some people, certainly, but not everybody's, you know, tallying up the number of cal calories and thinking really pros and cons of the thing. You're just kind of like, yeah, I want the fries. So that sounds good to me right now, right? So um, our decision making, it, we have basically two different ways of doing this. Um, and uh, so we often think of these as kind of being parallel processes. So they kind of work on their own, um, but they also interact. So if you think about the role of affect, um, something that I'm interested in is worry. Um, worry can actually kind of um, focus attention, make you think more about certain um, issues. So these things can interact. Um, and it's also the case that um, your emotion, how you're feeling in any given moment, whether that's related to the decision you're making or not, can also turn your attention to information. So. Um, feelings are information, um, and these processes can interact. Your your um, affect can inform or help you make decisions on this more deliberative level, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. I understand. Uh, and does health behavior also influence affect? I mean, is there uh, feedback between both things, that, or does it work the other way around as well? 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, obviously it depends on the behavior, the extent to which it's going to make you feel good or bad. Um, but a lot of behaviors are reinforcing. So if you, if you think about um, why we do things that are bad for us, we do it because we get some kind of benefit from it. It's reinforcing. So um, people who smoke, um, they might know very well that there are um, a number of issues that they might experience because of it. But in that moment, it's doing something beneficial for them. It's, you know, helping regulate stress or, um, you know, it, it's, it's activating the reward pathways in the brain that makes them feel good. Um, and similarly with things like physical activity, a lot of people experience affective responses to that. Some people negative, <laughs> some people positive. Um, and so, but this is reinforcing. So to the extent that a behavior makes you feel good or helps you reduce feeling bad, um, that's going to then reinforce the behavior, increase the likelihood that you're going to do it subsequently more in the future. So it certainly is this kind of reciprocal relationship that how you feel influences the decisions that you make and then ultimately the behaviors that you're doing, you get something, a response from that and that's just going to kind of cycle. And, um, the, you know, when you are it's kind of additional information. So we can anticipate feeling things from behavior as well. So, and that just kind of builds into this whole decision-making process. So you can anticipate feeling proud about doing a hard workout, for example. Um, and you can also anticipate feeling regret for not doing something. Um, so all of these things kind of work together, um, building and they kind of build and feed off of each other. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and since you mentioned physical activity, let's get into that. So okay. when, it, when it comes to exercise, we know that nowadays people are very sedentary. They don't do as much exercise as they should, unfortunately. And so, I mean, what are some of the most negative consequences of uh, physical inactivity? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Uh, physical activity, as you said, um, just generally people aren't getting enough. Um, so either they're, uh, we're not just even talking about people who, who are sedentary, but just even uh, a lot of people who are getting some activity aren't getting the recommended amounts. Um, and when it comes to inactivity, um, it's associated with a lot of things. Um, people are more at risk for uh, uh, numerous health disorders, um, including things like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, type 2 diabetes, um, you know, heart disease, um, certain cancers, uh, most notably breast and colon cancers. Um, and it's also associated with things like depression and anxiety. So there's potentially some mental health connection there too. Um, and like you said, if you, if you really consider how um, how common it is to be inactive. The, the burden on um, of disease is potentially pretty high. Um, and so it's, it's important for us um, to be thinking about that. Uh, and so uh, I think also, um, you know, it's, it's connected to longevity, it's co connected to these health disorders, but it's also associated with quality of life. Um, you know, if you are inactive, you don't have as much stamina, you're not as strong, um, your, your just general physical functioning isn't working as well as it could. And those things can um, not just influence how long you live, but the quality of life that you have. Um, and certainly as people get older, this is really important because obviously if your body is functioning better, you're going to be able to be more active, more social, more independent. So I think um, considering quality of life in this context is important also. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about um, about how it affects health at the present moment, but also the, about the long-term consequences of uh, chronic, let's say, physical inactivity, right? Yeah. So um, exercise can have uh, short-term consequences in that, um, again, not everybody, but a lot of people get um, kind of an immediate boost um, of, you know, uh, sort of maybe stress reduction or feeling good in the moment. Um, it can have a short-term benefits on cognition. It can kind of make you think clearer. Um, but then certainly 
um, maintaining and continuing an exercise uh, program or just, be, you know, it doesn't even have to be exercise per se, just like walking regularly can have benefits long term um, that are significant for longevity and just being happier, better well-being, quality of life. I was just about to say or to comment that uh, I mean, recently in the media, people have been talking a lot about, or at least I've been hearing a lot about the relationship between exercise and uh, mental health, particularly things like depression and anxiety. And there are supposedly studies, uh, I haven't read them, that make establish a link between uh, regular physical activity and reducing depression and anxiety and improving mood and things like that that you also alluded to right yeah so um, the I think the potential there goes back to the um, uh, positive response um, so for people who do experience positive affect either during or after physical activity it could be a means to help them cope with some of these disorders. So um, it's not going to be the magic pill and people who do have these disorders should definitely be seeking out other means of guidance and treatment, but it could help. Um, and any in, in those contexts, I think anything that you can do that's healthy, um, that makes you feel good, that's a good thing. You know, so basically it, it might help them cope more with these as opposed to just solving the problems. Mm -hmm. Right. And I mean, this is perhaps uh, an un uh, unfair question, let's say, but are there any validated ways, scientifically validated ways of increasing physical activity in people? Because I guess that, I mean, most of it uh, shouldn't work if I was to bet on it. Yeah, so um, I think you know, just sticking with this uh, topic of um, affect and, and emotion, um, choosing an activity that you enjoy, that gives you joy, that you actually like doing, is going to be much more motivating and something that you can sustain than if you choose to do something that you hate. Um, so I'm a I'm a runner, and uh, I get comments all the time. You know, people say things like, "I only run when chased," <laughs> and uh, you know, it's and I get that. Uh, not everybody is going to enjoy running. Um, some people find it incredibly boring. You know, I find it therapeutic. Um, but at the same time, you know, I'm really not a fan of um, sports, of, of like team sports, because I, I just am not coordinated. So I wouldn't. You know, I don't enjoy that, but other people would get a lot of enjoyment out of that. Um, so it doesn't mean that you're guaranteed to sustain, but I think that's one thing that you can do. Um, and when you talk about scientifically validated um, studies, the thing is that most of our research is really looking at more short term. Um, so we don't have a lot of knowledge on what uh, what really contributes to long-term sustaining of physical activity. Um, just like any behavior change, there's certain things that probably um, are more likely to help, things like starting small and building. So if you're sedentary, don't try to run a marathon. You know, that's not going to help you do that, at least not immediately the next day. Start small, build on from that. Um, learning skills. Um, identifying barriers um, in your that are preventing you from doing it and trying to figure out ways how to overcome those barriers. Um, so little things like that might be helpful. Um, but in terms of predictive factors, I think those are things that are still, um, there's still a big question mark about how we can get people to maintain and, and sustain long term um, for years and years. You know, which is what we want them to do because that's where you're going to get benefits from physical activity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, when it comes to health, there's another big set of uh, diseases or disorders that fall under the rubric of uh, addictive behavior, let's say, like uh, using mar marijuana, smoking, drinking, 
uh, and other aspects like that. So, uh, I mean, do they have any common threads, all of these kinds of addiction, or do we, do we have to deal with them on a one... Uh, I mean, do we have to, to approach them uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis or something like that? Um. So I'm not an addictions researcher, although I study addictive behaviors in the context of all these things. So with that caveat, um, one of the common factors, um, psychologically speaking, and that is also consistent with what we've talking, we're talking about, is that um, a, a lot of these behaviors, um, not all of them, but many of them, people use recreationally and and don't develop problems. Um, and so if you take drinking, for example, um, a lot of people recreationally consume alcohol and don't have problems related with it. And if you use at a reasonable, moderate level, you're probably not going to develop long-term issues of that. Um, so what we what might be one distinction is that it looks like problematic users use to cope with negative affect, whereas more recreational users use these behaviors more to enhance positive affect. So it's being used more as a coping strategy. Um, and certainly there's some things like the reinforcement properties of these behaviors. Um, you know, the things that you've asked about are more related to substance use. Um, uh, but at the same time, there are a lot of differences. Um, how, uh, how people respond to um, cannabis um, and why they use cannabis and motivations could be very different versus why they drink or why they smoke. So um, I think the answer is yes, there's some common themes, but there's each behavior is also unique. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, I guess that's a fair <laughs> answer. So, uh, and then in our lives, we go through this very complicated period that we call adolescence, yeah. <laughs> where people are more prone to unhealthy behaviors like these, right? So, I mean, are there any aspects that are associated with adolescence, like, for example, things that happen in the brain, hormones or others? that explain why people are more prone to risky behavior? Yeah, so one thing to keep in mind about adolescence is that um, it's, a, it's a unique period of exploration. These types of behaviors, exploring these behaviors, it's, it's normal. So just because uh, you know, a kid goes to a party and has a drink, they're not being a deviant. Um, they, that's normal exploration. They are um, starting to develop their independence um, from you know, family, parents. Um, they are starting to take responsibility for their decisions and making more adult decisions. And um, these require um, self-regulation, um, weighing consequences. And the thing about adolescence is that um, the brain, the parts of the brain that are responsible for these things, they're not fully developed. So they're making these kind of adult decisions with not quite an adult brain yet. And so that can have some repercussions in terms of how they make their decisions. Um, and a lot of the things that they explore, you know, are, are these behaviors that could have potentially negative consequences. Um, so if we go back to how I was describing decision making, you know, how you have this one pathway that's more deliberative, one pathway that's more um, reflexive and um, sort of you're non-conscious, you're not always thinking it through. Um, adolescents are more, we also kind of, we think, we um, use terms hot and cold cognitions. Um, cold cognition re refers to this more deliberative process. Hot cognitions are this more reflective and kind of in the moment type of process. And adolescents are just more prone to these hot cognitions. Um, it's not to say that they don't have intentions and, and they don't um, make plans or don't um, actually think through things. Um, it's just more like when they're in the situation and the situation presents itself, they're more inclined to do the thing that might be risky. So they don't intend to go drink tonight, but they find themselves at a party and because they're at the party, they're having a good time, they have a drink. Um, uh, so it's, it's um, they're just kind of, more prone to relying on so you know these kind of feelings and and um, uh, reacting to the situation as opposed to thinking through the long-term consequences. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and this applies to all kinds of behavior like drinking, uh, using drugs, and even risky sexual behavior, right? Yeah, so um, for, you know, anything that, if you consider that a lot of the things that we do that are not good for us, we do because they make us feel good, um, that makes a lot of sense in the context of adolescence. Um, you are, uh, adolescents are just sort of more driven by, you know, I'm going to make this decision because it's going to make me feel good right now rather than thinking about the consequences. So when you think about something like risky sex, um, you know, they are not necessarily thinking that, um, thinking through, oh, if I do this, I could contract a, a sexually transmitted illness, I could get pregnant. They're thinking this feels really good right now, um, I like how this is making me feel, um, you know, so yeah, it, it definitely applies to all these types of things. <laughs> Well, I mean, you mentioned the fact that adolescents don't have their brains fully developed. I guess that you were referring mostly to their prefrontal cortis cortices. And I, I mean, recently there have been those studies saying that we don't fully develop our prefrontal cortex and before age 25, 26, I guess yeah. that some time ago they put it at 30. So, and, <laughs> and in the case of men, I guess that never happens really. But <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, let me just ask you another thing about the uh, risky behavior that is. So we're talking in general here. But uh, have you done some work uh, regarding individual differences in terms of proneness to risky behavior? So when we talk about individual differences um, from a health psychology perspective, uh, I think it's important to keep in mind of this kind of whole systems perspective that we take. Um, when we when people often talk about individual differences they are thinking things like gender maybe race ethnicity um, age uh, and that can contribute certainly to these types of things but i think it's also uh, worth considering um, all kinds of different individual differences um, so thinking about uh, the level of individual difference a person might be considering um, neurocognitive factors so things like um, like we were saying, development, what parts of the brain are developed, you know, um, how a person's, you know, um, brain is, is working per se, um, genetic factors, certain um, people with certain um, phenotypes, uh, certain genes are um, potentially more um, reactive to, um, to situations that might make them more inclined for risky behaviors. There's also things like psychosocial factors, like um, beliefs or attitudes towards the behavior. Um, a lot of people talk about personality. Um, and there's also things like environment. Um, uh, the, uh, if a person it lives in an environment where they have, um, you know, lack of resources um, to kind of protect them from these behaviors. Um, so lower socioeconomic status regions, um, those types of things. So um, there's a lot of different ones. And the other thing is that they kind of work together as well. So if we go back to um, personality, a big one is impulsivity. Um, and impulsivity is related to risky behaviors. People who are more impulsive tend to engage in more risky behaviors. Um, but risk, uh, impulsivity is also associated with differences in neural functioning and structure. So they, they kind of all go, they work together a little bit. So um, that's a really broad response to your question, but um, I think, you know, any any type of behavior can have individual differences in terms of the frequency with which people engage in them. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, one question here is that we probably want to improve people's health, and one way to do that is through the messages that we convey to them. Uh, I mean, we can do that in schools, in the media, and so on. But uh, do we know if there are some kinds of messages that work better than others? And the, uh, what are the ones that work the best in trying to 
I don't know, for example, uh, promoting reducing smoking or quitting smoking altogether and things like that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so one thing about messaging is that they, um, they are largely designed to try to, at least in terms of smoking, they're largely designed to try to educate people and to inform the public about the harms of smoking. Um, and some messaging can be done to try to motivate behavior change, um, you know, whether that be physical activity or something like tanning. Um, they are not in and of themselves expected to make huge impacts, but they're supposed to kind of work as part of a larger entity. So I have a colleague who talks about messaging as um, being a cog in the wheel. Um, so it's not, you know, in and of itself, there might be small influences, but when you integrate them into this larger package, it could be very powerful and helpful. Um, so from that, with that said, um, when you think about the, the what types of messaging works, um, it's you you want to take into consideration the type of behavior as well as your population who are you trying to target so for example we were just talking about adolescents um, adolescents are um, potentially going to be um, uh, let me back up and say um, one one approach that we can use is to try to educate by presenting social norms giving normative information about how much do, does the typical university student drink? Or um, how do people think about binge drinking? Those types of things. Um, messages that focus on norms are probably going to be um, more effective when they're focused toward, excuse me, adolescents and young adults because they're more, they care more about their peer groups <laughs> relative to older adults. Not that older adults don't care, but they're just not quite as influenced by their peer situation as um, younger people. Um, there's also things like how we, how you actually frame the message. So we can, um, you can present the exact same information basically, and just by how you word it, you might have different outcomes. So if you take smoking, for example, we can say, um, we can do what we call a promotion framed message, which is to say, if you quit now, you will reduce your chances of heart disease by X percent. Mm -hmm. Or you can have what we call a, um, a loss framed message, which is going to be, um, uh, if you don't quit smoking, you are at this higher risk of developing heart disease. So, um, you, how you frame it can have important implications um, for how people take away from that. When it comes to cigarette messaging in particular, this is where um, research lies. Um, it really seems like messages that have images on them. Um, and this is um, globally, there's a lot of variation in how countries do this, and there's a lot of um, for a while, I would say a lot of uh, controversy around this, um, whether we should be putting these types of images on um, on uh, these warnings. So these would be images that might say, um, show what uh, a lung cancer looks like, or show a person who has um, maybe uh, mouth cancer from smoking, or it might show an eye that um, has um, cataracts or something like that. So the idea is that you are educating people and you're still putting the, the, the actual text information in there, but you're showing an image that also backs up the information. And the idea is that it's providing more context. So um, a lot of people, when they talk about smoking, they, um, they say, well, I know that it causes lung cancer. Everybody knows that or something along those lines, right? But it's one thing to know um, cognitively, I guess, that it, it's connected to these things. It's another thing to actually recognize what that means. So throat cancer, yeah, that sounds awful, but it's more informative to see what that actually looks like. And so that can provide more context in terms of education and knowledge. And the other thing is that these images seem to 
help capture attention and um, do have some implications in terms of memory and recall of the content of the message. Um, so it really seems to be the case. Um, I would say there's quite a bit of new research coming out um, that is basically saying that these pictorial warnings are effective because um, they are eliciting this um, emotional response. Um, so it kind of goes back into what we've been talking about. Um, and obviously there's the, some people who don't like it, some people who think it's it's um, potentially problematic, but I'd say more and more um, what we're seeing is that in terms of memory and knowledge, and people actually learning from these things, there is a connection between the emotional responses that they're they're getting from these and what they're actually learning um, from these. No problem. I, I was asking if, for example, by changing social norms in terms of how people think about uh, the attitudes they associate with drinking, with smoking, etc. Uh, and if by penalizing or punishing socially people, uh, ostracizing them a little <laughs> bit by performing those kinds of behaviors, mm -hmm. if, if changing social norms in those sorts of ways could also have a positive effect in reducing uh, negative behaviors, addictive ones, the ones that are bad for your health, even though people usually don't like that kind of approach. Yeah, and, and so obviously um, the goal is not to ostracize people or to, to make people feel less than somebody else because of the choices that they're making. Um, the goal is really to um, the, the issue with a lot of norms is that there's a lot of misperceptions about the norms. And so one of the approaches with normative messaging is actually to correct misperceptions. So if we take, for example, drinking in university students, um, in the U.S. at least, uh, drinking is a big problem um, in, at some universities. But part of this seems to be because of a misperception of a, a stereotypical college student. Um, if we think about them, we think heavy partiers, heavy drinkers, lots of binge drinking, that kind of thing. Um, but if you actually look at the norms, um, a lot of students report actually, you know, granted that if they're in the United States drinking age is 21, so they shouldn't be drinking, but um, they're not reporting exorbitant amounts of, of consumption. Um, and the other thing is that a, a lot of them report um, thinking that it's not a good idea to, to binge and, and that type of thing. So what we try to do is um, more and more universities are doing this with incoming students who are freshmen, you know, straight from home, 18-year-olds, um, trying to give them the information on what the normative behaviors are so that they have more accurate perceptions of what other people are actually doing so they don't feel kind of this um, pressure to engage heavily in these behaviors when other people really aren't doing those things. So that's kind of the I, one of the approaches is to not so much ostracize, but to inform and, and try to help, um, you know, uh, shape the, the, the accurate perceptions of the norms. Um, and th in terms of um, you know, highlighting, say, um, most people don't think that this is a good idea or, you know, um, the idea is not so much to um, make a person feel bad for choosing to drink or something like that, um, but to just kind of influence in, in, a, in, a, in a different way, um, targeting something that we think might actually be important, a factor for predicting whether they're going to engage in these behaviors. Um, one example recently is um, if you e-cigarettes, which is um, becoming a very popular thing with adolescents in particular in the United States. Um, and one of the concerns is that it might be actually changing perceptions of tobacco use in general. And so why we've been seeing this, this shift in uh, you know, generally people don't have super positive attitudes of, of smokers, um, but a concern is that as e-cigarettes are becoming more popular, that perception might be shifting, and then 
further encouraging them to use. So um, for that perspective, we would, you know, that's something that a lot of people are kind of keeping an eye on because we certainly don't want that perception to take hold and then subsequently influence them more. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So just to, to, to try to establish a bridge between my previous two questions and the last one that I want to make, um, I mean, we were talking about messaging and messages and I guess that one of the professional groups out there that are the most responsible for telling people what are the best things they can do with their health are medical professionals, doctors and other health professionals. So, I mean, when it comes to uh, following medical advice uh, and treatment compliance, why is it that sometimes or many times even it's so difficult for people to to follow up with it um that's a great question and um i think that's why health psychologists will have jobs for a really long time um so um it's when you think about just health behavior in general it's it's not behavior change is difficult it's really hard to get people to change their behaviors um they have developed habits that we're trying to get them to change. We're trying to get them to develop new habits and, and so on. Um, so getting people to initiate a behavior is fairly easy. Um, and, and, and I'm saying easy really callously here. Um, so it's not, it's not actually that easy. But when you think about initiating behavior, doing something once versus trying to get them ma to maintain for years, initiate it is easy, <laughs> right? Um, so if you think about, okay, if you're, um, your doctor says you need to be taking this pill every day um, or you need to be consuming more water or something like that, these are fairly easy things to do. Um, but if it's, you know, um, you need to take 10 pills a day or um, you need to completely alter your diet, these are going to be more complicated. So the more complicated the behavior, um, the more um, nuanced the, the, the treatment um, the adherent, you know, whatever it is that they need to be adhering to, the harder it's going to be. Um, the other thing is, if you even if you take something like um, a, a pill, um, if we again going back to this decision making thing, um, the context makes a, a, a big difference. So a lot of people intend to do the things that their doctors say that they should be doing. They intend to take the the medication. Um, a lot of people forget simply they forget um, and so it's it this is again that distinction between what your intentions are the the decision making that you're you're doing in terms of um, weight costs and benefits and that kind of thing and then just n not being aware of your environment and how that might influence the the, the decision in this case to not do it um, so some things are, are simply like setting up cues so you remember um, if you tend to forget that you need to be taking your vitamins, put the vitamins next to your toothbrush, you know, so that you don't forget. If you hide it away in a cabinet, then you're going to forget. So you can modify your environment to try to make these things more um, likely. Um, but just in general, long-term maintenance of behavior is difficult. And when we look at initiation versus maintenance, the things that are going to motivate a person to start a behavior are not going to be the things that motivate a person to maintain. So if you take something like, say your doctor says that you need to start an exercise program um, to help with uh, various different things, one of the main motivations for people to start exercise is because they want to lose weight. And so um, the weight loss can be reinforcing, right? You're, that is your goal. People are commenting on how good you look, so that can be reinforcing. But then once you get to your goal, and then the doctor's like, great, this is where you need to be, now maintain this. What's the reinforcement there? You, you're no longer getting that you know, kick from people commenting on how good you look or um, seeing the numbers go down on the scale. So you have to figure out different ways to maintain or to be motivated. And when it comes to things like treatment compliance for certain medical uh, 
programs, I mean, some of them are just not that enjoyable, <laughs> right? So, you know, um, some treatment uh, that you need to do are, is actually, frankly, unpleasant. And so um, in the moment when you're making those decisions about doing it or not doing it, um, that can override, you know, the, the knowledge that this is going to make you feel bad or that you're not going to like it can override the, I know that this is long-term beneficial for me. So I'm not sure that that's really getting at what you were asking, but um, I think if you just kind of think about it in terms of short-term versus long-term and that we have different motivations for how we think about these things, um, that might be one way of considering it. Okay, so just one last follow-up question. Could there also be an element there of some people at least not being able to properly follow medical instructions because of, for example, the language that is used and the fact that they are not really high in cognitive ability, they are, for example, low in IQ or something like that? Could there also be that element there? Yeah, there's certainly um, sometimes a disconnect between the medical advice that we get and what we understand uh, and how we interact with our medical professionals. Um, uh, there's definitely, this is part of, um, there's certainly people in health psychology who focus on this. Um, how do you help medical professionals engage with their patients in a way that actually helps them understand? Um, and this is really important because the medical field in general is moving more towards um, autonomy. So allowing the, the patient to make decisions in, instead of the decision being made for the patient, which is historically how it used to be. Um, and so that means that the, the people who are, the patients need to understand. Um, and it, it, regardless of IQ, um, you can have very intelligent people who just don't know anything about medicine. Uh, not understand. And people can be fearful of asking questions. Um, so you can certainly um, encourage and work with people to, you know, actually ask these questions and clarify issues so that they know that they are um, doing the right thing. Um, but this is definitely one of those things where knowledge is power. So, you know, you can't make right, good decisions for your own health if you don't actually understand what's happening. So you've got to ask questions. And that then does carry over into things like medical adherence and things like that. If you don't actually understand what the replica repercussions are of not doing this treatment, why would you continue to do it? Um, with that said, a lot of people do know, you know, the repercussions of, of not doing something and they might still choose not to do it. So it just kind of, there's a lot of variation there. But certainly you are right that um, the, the patient plays a big role in terms of um, making sure they understand what the doctor is actually telling them to do. Okay, great. So, Dr. Magnan, let's end the interview here. Let's end on that note. But before we go, would you like to tell people where they can find your work on the Internet or elsewhere? Are there any good places, where websites where they can go to? Um, a lot of my research is listed on um, the uh, um, database pubmed.gov. Um, uh, so, and uh, they can also go to the WSU Psychology website and find my website. I'm sorry, I don't remember what it's, what it's actually called off at the top of my head. Um, but if they look at WSU Psychology, um, they can find my name and then they can find my website that lists some more information about my research. Okay, great. So I will be leaving links to all of that, your work in the description box of the interview so that people can go and check it out because it's very interesting. And Dr. Magnan, again, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show and it was a really lovely conversation, at least I loved it. So thank you so much for taking the time. Absolutely, thank you. Hello everybody, thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've been putting out regular interviews with leading intellectuals from around the world. 
and so to keep the channel sustainable I would really like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. You can also support me via PayPal. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Pereira Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantal Gilinas, Francis Ford, Hans Friedrich Sunda, Brian Rivera, Sergio Condriano, Yane Henninen, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Vega Gidi, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, David Diaz, Anian Kata, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henrik Alenius, John Connors, Dr. Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, and Bo Weingard, my four producers, Isar Webb, Rosie, Jim Frank, and Lucas Stafiniak, and my executive producer, Michel Ruzieski. Thank you for all.